to meet Ryan in this next section we're going to continue with the switching overview carrying on from the previous video and we're going to take this opportunity to introduce something new called ARP the address resolution protocol so far throughout this series we've talked about the open system interconnect and the TCP IP models we've talked about IP as a protocol and subnetting and I think with the previous introduction of the overview of switching this would be a great opportunity to pull that all together and have a conversation regarding ARP and once we know ARP in detail we're going to jump on to some practical hardware and wire captures and look how ARP actually works and how a switch populates this table we're going to go through the flooding filtering folding and learning process a switch goes through alongside why a host may want to utilize ARP in order to find the destination it needs to reach. But before we can get into that, we need to first understand how ARP actually works. So pen to paper, we're going to have a discussion around the refresh of switching and then how that interacts and how it helps with your understanding of ARP. So just to recap, for those who don't know, you can contact me here on YouTube on LinkedIn or Twitter and from our previous videos this was the last slide that we had a discussion about which was understanding how a frame is put for a switch and the questions that a switch asks itself as it goes through the motions we said that a switch learns based on source and forwards based on destination we said as the frame is received on an interface the source address is put into a MAC address table against the port number once that's been learned and if it's already learned it's refreshed against the timer it then looks at the destination and if the destination is a broadcast multicast or an unknown unicast the frame is flooded and if it's not a second question comes to mind is the source and destination on the same interface if it is the frame is filtered because we can't send traffic out the way it came in and if it's none of those then it must be unicache traffic one to one we must know where the destination actually resides so we can send it to the correct port now understanding that moving on to ARP and understanding why we need to do ARP will help cement the information we've learned about switching and how hosts communicate on the local network. So let's start with an overview of ARP. ARP is the address resolution protocol and there's a few important things to know about it. The goal of ARP is to help create the layer 2 frame. PCs are set with IP addressing but what they don't know is what's the MAC address of the destination device that they're trying to communicate with and ARP allows us to send a request onto the network to ask for the MAC address of the PC in order to create the layer 2 frame. But there are two important elements here and that is depending on the destination depends on who we ARP for. So if the destination is on my subnet we would ARP directly to the host. If the destination is not on my subnet then we would ARP for the gateway. Now we're going to go into these in a bit more detail looking at this topology that I've put together here we can see that we have PCA using 192.168.04 slash 24 PCB which is 192.168.05 slash 24 and a router utilizing 192.168.01 slash 24 now hopefully you've gone through my previous videos around IP addressing and subnetting and you're able to identify that all three of these clients, PCs, devices, whatever you want to call them, are all inside the same subnet. Now because of that, they would use this. They will ARP directly for the host. So what do I mean by that? Now let's say PCA wants to pull a file of PCB. On PCB we have let's say an FTP server and 
we're going to pull a file off this FTP server. PCA has to create that request for that file. So in order to do that, first of all, it gets the FTP request and it creates it at the application layer. And that is including the application, the presentation and the session. It then passes it downstream to the layer 4 protocol. In this case, will be TCP because FTP utilizes TCP. It then passes it further downstream to layer 3, which is IP. And at this stage, it starts to populate the information. At least the information that we're concerned about regarding ARP. In this IP header, amongst other things, it will have the source IP of 192.168.04 and the destination IP of 192.168.05. And it knows this for two reasons. One, the 192.168.04 has been configured on the NIC card within PCA and it knows the destination of 192.168.05 because in the FTP client on this PC I've typed in the destination that I want to communicate with but where it starts to come undone is when we get to layer 2 which is Ethernet. This is because the source Mac would be my local NIC let's say that's a a a a a a a but I don't know the destination MAC address and because I don't know the destination MAC address I'm unable to complete the layer 2 frame so in order for me to complete that layer 2 frame I need to up using the address resolution protocol sending an up request asking the network Whoever has 192.168.05, please will you respond and tell me your MAC address. And in order to do that, I send out a frame, a ARP request to a specific address. And because I don't know where that person lives, I send it to the all Fs. So tidy it up a little bit. You can see I put the frame at the top. And at the moment this frame is incomplete. Because we don't know the destination MAC address. And until we know the destination MAC address, we can't send the frame. So as I said, the ARP address resolution protocol sends out a request. And inside this ARP it's essentially asking who is 192.168.05 and what is your MAC address that goes out to the destination MAC of all F's and it's received on port 1 of the switch port 1 looks at that source and says oh hello PCA I see your MAC address of a a a a a a a and I'm gonna add that into my MAC address table against port 1 it then looks at the destination and says oh your destination is all F's and I know that all F's means broadcast and my action is to flood the traffic. So a request goes out port 24 towards the router and a request goes out to port 2 towards the PC. Now when the router receives that frame, that ARP request, it notices as it comes in at layer 1, it looks at the signals, pass it to Ethernet, Ethernet looks at the destination MAC address sees it as all F's and says hey that could be me so it decapsulates the layer 2 frame 
looks at the layer 3 IP header and says actually I am 192.168.01 and not 192.168.05 therefore this is not for me and it's dropped by the router but when the PC gets it and it decapsulates the layer 2 and looks at the layer 3 and says oh I am 192.168.05 this frame is for me and then it looks further into the actual layers it will notice hey this is an ARP request I better send an ARP reply so it sends back a ARP reply with the destination of router A with the MAC of all A's and the source of itself with its MAC address in the source of all B's and it's received inbound on port 2. Port 2 goes, hey, I've received a frame on port 2. I don't know about anyone on port 2, so I need to learn something. And I need to learn that the MAC address of BBBB lives out port 2. It then says, okay, what's the destination? Oh, the destination is AAAA. Well, I know from a previous frame that AAAA lives out of port 1. So it doesn't flood the traffic, but it sends a forward, a unicast switch from port 2 to port 1 towards PCA. Now PCA has received the ARP reply and knows the MAC address of 192.168.05. And because of that, it's able to complete the layer 2 frame of the FTP that we originally needed to complete so we can fill that information in now and then the FTP information can be sent or the FTP request can now be sent onto the network and as it comes in on the switch the switch will receive this FTP request. It won't know it's an FTP because the switch doesn't decapsulate it that far. In fact, what the switch does is looks at the Ethernet header and says, What's the destination? BBBB. And knows from the previous ARP where BBB lives and is able to unicast switch from port 1 to port 2. What it will also do is it will refresh the timer on port 1 for the MAC address of AAAA and inside both PCs they will also keep a ARP cache different to a MAC address table it's called an ARP cache and it's a binding between the IP to MAC addresses because remember the switch doesn't know about IPs not at this level the switch is only layer 2 and all it cares about is what MAC address lives on what port. It doesn't know about IPs and it won't perform ARP. It only performs switching. Only devices that generate the traffic will perform ARP. So in PCA we would have 192.168.04 with a mapping to the all A's and 192.168.05 with the mappings to all B's and on the MAC address table of the switch we would know that the A MAC address is reachable out of port 1 and the B MAC address is reachable out of port 2 and providing that communication happens up every so often and it doesn't expire the ARP cache in any of the devices then the communication can always, build, be, always be built successfully. If PCA doesn't speak to PCB for a period of time 
then PCA will need to go through the ARP process again on learning that MAC address in order to complete that layer 2 frame. You can do things like manually statically enter the MAC address to IP inside the PC to prevent the ARP resolution protocol from taking effect, but it has very little overhead and it's not worth the time or effort. Now we've seen an example of ARP. If we just bring up the questions that we said earlier, we said that it's used to help to create the layer 2 frame, and we know why that is now, because the PC that's creating the payload or creating the data won't be able to create the layer 2 frame unless it knows the destination MAC address. And if it doesn't know that, it has to use ARP. And we said that we have these two questions. If destination IP address is in my subnet, I ARP directly for the host. And that was an example of what we just seen, where the PC looked at the IP address and said, hey, 192.168.05, that's on my network. Therefore, I must be able to reach it. So it ARPed directly for 192.168.05. Now, if the IP address is not on my subnet, let's say, for example, the PC needed to communicate with 8.8.8.8, the PC would run a binary AND calculation, which we'll get into later, look at the subnet, or look at the destination IP, I should say, and notice that's not part of the slash 24 that's configured on its NIC card and because of that it will actually create a layer 2 frame with the destination MAC address of the 192.168.01 so it will ARP for the 192.168.01 and the reason for that is because PCA and PCB have been told that if you want to get off your network you need to go to your default gateway and your default gateway is 192.168.01. Now, I'm not going to go into too much depth now, but when we get into routing and understanding how routing works, this will become more clear. But for now, I just want you to grasp the idea of ARP. ARP is a IP to MAC address resolution protocol. It's used to help create the layer 2 frames when a device needs to send traffic onto the network. It will ARP for the device directly if the destination IP lives inside the subnet and if the destination IP lives outside the subnet, i.e. 8.8.8.8, it has to go to its default gateway. But because layer 2 communication, in this case Ethernet, only happens inside a segment or inside a broadcast domain, it will can only ARP to its default gateway which is 192.168.01. But like I said, later on when we go into more detail regarding ARP and how routing works, this should become more clear. Okay, so that's all we've got time for in this lesson. Hopefully that's given you a good understanding of switching and the address resolution protocol. And now you can see why I believe ARP is a nice complement as a technology to the understanding of switching and why switching complements ARP. Both them together really help cement the knowledge of how a PC communicates with a PC or its default gateway inside a broadcast domain and how a switch learns, floods and filters traffic. In the next video we're going to jump into some actual labs and see this in a real environment with some packet captures and actually see it in action. I hope this video has been informative. And I'd like to thank you for viewing, and if it has been, please do like and subscribe.